Recall that in part 1 we discussed what it means for a vector field f to be irrotational. It means that the curl of f is zero. That in turn tells us that f can be written as the gradient of a function phi, known as the potential for f. We then discovered that we can do the path integral of f along any path between two points, and it doesn't matter what the path is, the value will simply be the value of phi evaluated between the two endpoints, p1 and p2, in the usual manner of substituting integration variables. In this part 2 of the recording, I'm going to introduce an actual example of a vector field f, show that it is irrotational, calculate the potential, and then do a path integral. I'll solve the following problem. Here is an f. First of all, we will show that it's irrotational. We will then ask the question, what is the phi, the potential for f? And then finally, we'll pick two points, here the origin and the point 2, 1, 3 in three dimensions, and evaluate the path integral of f dot dr along the path c, where c is any path between those two points. I've colour-coded the questions, and I'm going to colour-code the solutions as well, so that you can jump back and forth a bit easier. If f is to be irrotational, part 1, that means that its curl must be zero. Here's the curl expressed in the usual way of using the determinant. We have to expand the determinant, unfortunately. Here it is before the differentiations. Now look at some of those differentiations. Look at the first one. d by dy of 2x squared z. 2x squared z doesn't depend on y, so that differentiation will just be zero. There are several terms we can cross out in that manner. Let's do that immediately. Well, that's a good start. Things have simplified significantly, haven't they? There is now no i term to worry about. For the rest, though, we will have to do the differentiations. I'll uncover that step next. Well, actually, they're not very hard. And I'm sure you can quickly see that in both cases, the coefficient of j and k both cancel. That means that our answer is just the zero vector. So the curl of this f is zero, and therefore the f is irrotational. That's part one finished. What was part two? Find the potential phi for f. This is the part that's a little bit harder and takes a bit of ingenuity. Let's assume, as we're entitled to do, that the potential phi exists and insist that f be equal to the grad of phi. We try to find phi. What we need to do here is to write out the three separate components of that vector equation for f1, f2 and f3. As I write them out, I'm going to reverse the order as well and write d phi 1 by dx equals f1, and so on. You might have to check back and look at the details of the f to be sure that I've done it right. So there's the first component, d phi dx, and f1 is y squared plus 2xz squared. I've numbered that equation 1. Equation 2 and 3 work in a similar way, the second and third components. What we've got here is three first-order differential equations for phi. Each one of them is very easy to solve by integration. We can do it in any order we like, but we've got to make sure that phi satisfies all three. I'll start by getting number one out of the way as it looks the most complicated. Let's integrate number one with respect to the variable x. So we get the integral d phi dx dx equals the integral y squared plus 2xz squared dx. On the left hand side, the integral of phi dx with respect to x is just going to be phi, isn't it? So that looks like we're actually getting an expression for the potential we want. On the right hand side, y and z can be regarded as constants, so the only serious integration we have to do is the 2x bit, which will become, two, which will become x squared. There's our phi. And well, is that the answer? Well, careful. There should have been an integration constant, shouldn't there? I've put it in. But now we must be even more careful. 
it's only an integration constant as far as x is concerned. It might well depend on y and z. So it's not a true constant, only so far as x is concerned. If you don't trust that, picture differentiating this equation. You'll get dy dx, and you'll get y squared on the right, and 2xz, and then the c part will disappear because it doesn't depend on x. So it is valid to have that c part there in principle. So we haven't quite got our phi, but we have made progress. We've satisfied equation 1. What we have to do now is to go back and satisfy equation 2 as well. To make that work, we'll have to substitute our phi. Substitution, of course, is just on the left-hand side. We can easily enough work out d phi by dy. Once we've done that, we have to insist that it equals 2xy on the right-hand side. Let's do that and see what happens. So, d phi dy. The y squared becomes 2y, so we get 2yx. The x squared z squared is a constant so far as y is concerned, so it disappears. But we now have a dc dy. That's the left-hand side of equation 2. We now have to insist that that equals the right-hand side, which is 2xy. Well, that's not so bad, is it? 2xy and 2yx are equal, so we can cross them off both sides. So we've simply learned that dc by dy equals 0. That's telling us that, in fact, c doesn't really depend on y at all. Only we had to assume from the beginning that it might. In some examples, c would depend on y. In that case, we would find the dependence by solving the correct equation here. However, we should be happy. Our example is simpler. c depends only on z. So, with that information at hand, let's now once again write out our phi. This phi satisfies equations 1 and 2. That leaves 3 to go. Clearly, number 3 is going to fix the z dependence of c for us. Let's go back and look at 3. It's here. d phi dz. We need to substitute our phi into that left-hand side and get d phi dz. On the right, we must insist that it equals 2x squared z. So differentiating phi with respect to z, the y squared x term disappears z squared becomes 2z, so we get 2x squared z. And then there's the c. In principle it might depend on z, so we'd better write dc dz. And equation 3 told us that this left-hand side must equal the 2x squared z that is on the right. Once again there's some neat cancellation, and we're left with dc dz equals 0. Since c doesn't depend on x, y or z, that means that it really is a true constant in this example. It won't always happen, but here it has. The constant could be anything, but remember we're looking at a potential. The only useful manifestation of a potential is via its gradient, and the gradient of a constant is zero. So in any physical manifestations that we might need to measure in physics or engineering, we won't notice the C that might be present in the potential, we can therefore throw it away and let c be zero. So we should conclude this part two of the problem by writing out our potential. I've simply copied it from the top of the screen and left off the c of z. Let's now address the third part of the question. That's the green question, part three. Evaluate the path integral of f dot dr where c is any path from zero to the point 2, 1, 3. It's this integral. Since we know already that it's going to be the same value whatever path we take, I don't need to write the name of a path C on it. Simply the endpoints. All we have to do then is to substitute f equals grad phi. And then, without actually filling in any details, grad phi dot dr, remember from part one of this presentation, it's just d phi. But the integral of d phi is phi. And we just need to put in the two endpoints, 0 and p. The rest is just arithmetic. Substitute the top point, 2, 1, 3, and then subtract. 
and substitute the lower point. But since that's the origin, that'll just be a value 0. The value is 38. But that's just by the way. The really important thing here is that this result was path independent. It doesn't matter what path we take from 0 to p, we'll always get the value 38 for the integral. I'll conclude this presentation here.